over the course of thousands of years of human civilization, I believe that human beings have essentially found themselves in two different camps about how we view the fundamental nature of reality. And I think there are kind of different sub camps, you know, different kind of variations of these ideas. But I think nothing is actually really stable except these two potential realities or views of reality that, that we've found. Yesterday, I was thinking about, I guess I was, I was thinking about nuclear war and the fact that there's probably over 10,000 nuclear warheads in the global arsenal. And if we're able to essentially level a city with one of these, well, what will 10,000 do? And, and I think that nuclear war Everyone says that it's it could be the end of humanity, but I, I think that it's I think that humanity and life would survive. It would just put us back several hundred years. Nuclear war is something that we've as a society wanted to ignore for a very long time. Or we want to ignore, we want to pretend that it doesn't exist, or that it's uh, unthinkable. Um, and and why is that? Beyond just the you know, the surface level horror of essentially all of civilization collapsing and humanity being on the brink of death. I think it shines a, a light on a much deeper existential question about humanity. It's, and it's, it's, it's the question of what, happens after we die and what would it mean to not exist because let's assume that a nuclear war didn't just cripple humanity and put us back several hundred years let's imagine that it destroyed everything on earth and there was no living being on earth and maybe in the entire universe what would that mean? And if, if you follow this line of reasoning and apply it to yourself, what, would it, what does it mean if you don't exist? Um, and this is, this is a great thought experiment, I think. If you, if you really, 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 really ponder um, what, do, what would it mean for you not to exist? That, that <laughs> if, if you, if you, by following that logic, you can you can very easily get into a kind of a crazy existential shock because your consciousness is viewing a potential where your consciousness doesn't exist. And it, it kind of leads to this recursive uh, thought pattern that kind of, I don't know, jolts through you. And, well, I think that only happens if you really, really try and empathize with, 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 with yourself after you're gone. But the problem is once you do that, you realize there is nothing there. And, and if there's, and that essentially means that you as like this subjective entity to, that comprises your entire universe, your entire universe is encapsulated in your subjective experience if that's gone then what what is what is there's your your well i i think words words can't really describe kind of the well the terror that can come from that concept um but it's a concept that may very well be true and I think humanity has struggled with this idea since its very beginning. And, and I think this is the fundamental idea 
what is consciousness? What is the meaning of consciousness? What happens after we die? And fundamentally, what is the nature of the universe? And this ultimately leads to only two logically consistent and reasonable answers, I would say. The first one, and the one that I think is the null hypothesis, is that once you die, you no longer exist. And consciousness is only a small part of reality that emerges from natural processes. And in essence, consciousness would be kind of an illusion or a whiff of smoke. With this idea, you essentially say that the universe is essentially governed by principles and laws and there's really nothing else. It's just this kind of absurd mechanical clock that just exists and continues until until it ends or maybe it cycles back and begins again if you uh, if you subscribe to conformal cyclic cosmology that's an option that's an option and I think that this is an option this is a belief that I think has been the default for humanity I think humanity is kind of we think that 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 human society is a very deeply theistic society but I don't really think so and and you could you're, you're probably gonna you're probably not gonna agree with me on that but I, I I think that it's true I think that the main the main global superpowers or the main global civilizations that have existed essentially really deep down thought that the universe operated like this. I think the Romans essentially thought like this, the Japanese, the Greeks, the Chinese. I think they, they believed in an unconscious just universe that 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 began and maybe ended and there was really nothing that uh, there's no meaning or there was no inherent narrative behind it it was simply a you know a brief moment and and you could say that Okay, well, the Romans believed had the Roman pantheon and the Greeks had the Greek pantheon. And, you know, there are all these different pagan gods, right? But I still think that, that those societies were still essentially atheist. Uh, the Roman and Greek gods were, they weren't really, they were more of more stories. And at the deepest, in the deepest sense, they were kind of uh, a god of the gaps, almost, I would say. They were explanations for phenomenon. And maybe you had, you know, the primitive tribes that, that created the Roman Empire or the Greek Empire. You know, maybe these started out as, you know, stories that maybe people genuinely believed. But what it evolved into, what the, what the, the stable societies evolved into were were societies where, you know, gods were these, were people. They were people, you know, super people that existed in a, you know, a hidden realm that, you know, had a lot of power and explained a lot of phenomenon, but, but gods died and, and they, they, what, what's the point of, of, of these, these, these things weren't really metaphysical 
in the sense that we we understand or how would you say it? maybe not metaphysical but but gods in the way that monotheism defines gods i think that that the way that we can define pagan gods are essentially gnomes that pagan gods are are gnomes that kind of do everything like what's uh how how does my phone work there's a little gnome inside that 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 calculates numbers how does the thunder work there's a there's zeus that uh that throws lightning bolts um uh, and you see on all these like pagan societies there's just spirits and gods that kind of do everything it's it's a glue that kind of explains things but it doesn't really mean that 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 there's a narrative reason behind everything. There's a inherent meaning behind everything. It's it's still it's all like a whim. Like like why did Zeus want to do this and why did Athena want to do that? It's because it was just their whim. It was a you know the universe is a a chaotic place where there is no rhyme or reason and some people are lucky and some people aren't and and that's essentially a universe that where there is no uber consciousness or ultra consciousness that guides reality it's it's the opposite so that's that's the null hypothesis that's option 1 and and i think it's a stable option i think that societies that have essentially believed in this have been stable societies. They have done great things. We can see societies that essentially adhere to this idea. They've created the the Roman temples. They've created um, the Colosseum. They've created the Parthenon. They've created you know Japanese architecture and Chinese architecture, and and these societies have been able to achieve. I would say. And they have been stable. But I do think that they are still essentially atheist societies. And, and one other thing I want to add to this. Because in these societies, human consciousness, you know, essentially doesn't really mean much in the grand scheme of things. But it still means a lot to you. I think the way that people have engaged with the metaphysical or have engaged in in the spiritual because I think all societies all all societies that are stable have this as a core element the way that these societies have engaged with the spiritual has been either via, you know, meditation or these kind of spiritual practices like you, you see in Japan, there's like prayer ceremonies, even though they're atheists. Um, you can see kind of these, these traditions. And I'd say the larger kind of overarching thing that these societies do to engage with the spiritual is a veneration and I guess, an intense adherence and ri raising up of the aesthetic. These societies have all had a very good grasp of aesthetic practices, uh, art, architectures. And I think that, that the ultimate purpose of uh, these atheistic societies is to create uh, a beautiful society. Beauty is, and aesthetics are the the peak of what these societies aim to aspire to because well the 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 that's the way that you can kind of for the brief time that you exist in our society that's the way that you can maybe experience the the you know the most refined and the highest form of your existence it's through aesthetics and through kind of a a shared collective 
narrative and a collective kind of story of beauty. So that's society number one. Society number two is what I would probably call the the narrative society or the narrative consciousness or the infinite consciousness. In this way of looking at the world, instead of, you know, at the limits of human or at the limits of the universe, instead of there being nothing, there's consciousness. So the first idea, there's a small consciousness and then what stretches out into infinity is nothing. It's just material. And the other idea, there's consciousness, there's material, you know, abiotic reality, just, just reality itself. And then what exists beyond it, you know, is like a super consciousness is, and, and you could consider that God. And this worldview, this thought about reality, essentially says that things aren't only meaningful to your own little head while you're alive and then you die and then it's, you know, it actually didn't have much, any inherent meaning. This worldview says that because there is an infinite consciousness that oversees all reality. Every, everything in reality has an inherent narrative meaning because it is being observed and influenced and kind of guided by this conscious force. One reason why I think that this, well, this might make sense in terms of how we One reason why I think this makes sense, given modern quantum physics, is because reality is fundamentally probabilistic and indeterminate. Uh, Newtonian physics tells us that basically if we, if we knew the velocity and mass of everything in the world, you could, with 100% accuracy, predict what's going to happen. But with quantum physics... That isn't exactly the case. Now, if I have an electron, it's not, it's not like a little golf ball that just is orbiting an atom. An electron is, it's weird. It's a cloud of potential areas where the electron could be. And once it's observed, like you shoot a, a photon at it, then it's no longer a cloud, then it exists somewhere. And it's not, oh, it's, it's, it's like that. It is that. That is how the electron operates. And, and you can describe where is the electron going to be through a, what's called a wave function. So you have a, a bunch of possible locations where it can be. And, you know, there, there's a higher probability it'll be like here, but then there's a lower probability that it's out there, but it can still be there. And where the electron ends up being is random. Now there's higher probabilities and lower probabilities, but it's still random. And, and some, some physicists have tried to explain their way out of it saying, oh, there's, it's actually not random. There's a, an equation that, that determines where it's going to collapse or, or the multiverse theory, where no, it's not random. There's just an infinite number of universes where every single possibility happens. So, so it's not random. We just happen to be in the the one universe where it collapsed this way. But I I would say that those are those are kind of they aren't very good explanations. They're honestly they're a little bit pseudo scientific. Um, the best interpretation we have about reality right now is that the universe, or through the Copenhagen interpretation, is that the universe at the very fundamental level is random. And, and you could say that, okay, well, then that means that everything is random 
and great. Who cares? What I would say is that this means that if probability, if probability manipulation was something that had to have a way to interact with our reality, it would be through this. Because if things essentially are random at the base baseline of what we can perceive, then, well, I would argue that that is where a conscious entity or God or, or however you would want to call it would be able to exercise will over reality. And, and this is, I think, what may be the fundamental way of understanding the, the narrative or infinite consciousness view of the world I think this is could be you know one of the basis points of how you could understand it. God is a conscious entity and God is the storyteller behind existence and can essentially has has determined the initial conditions and can you know fine tune how things go through probability as it proceeds. And what this essentially means is that because there is a conscious observer behind everything, there is a conscious meaning behind everything, and that there is a continuous story that defines reality rather than reality only being meaningful for the blip of an instant that your consciousness exists and then falls apart. And this idea takes your actions and, and makes them all hold an infinite weight to them. And it also means that all of your actions are those, all of your actions exist under the microscope of of God, essentially. And, and that means that these societies are fundamentally governed by guilt. Because if you, if you know essentially what the consciousness of God wants, and what are the, what's the nature of the rules behind that, God, then any deviation from that plan that God creates is 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 an imperfection and 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 you are held kind of infinitely responsible for that because the plan is is all encompassing and if you're a part of the plan and you deviate from the plan, then, or maybe not the plan, but the principles behind it, then you're held to an extreme accountability. Now, the pro of this is that it leads to a society where everyone essentially self-regulates. But I think the con of this is when you have a synthesis of both of these civilizational types and and I think that that's when the guilt essentially uh, goes a little crazy. I think we can kind of see that in our modern civilization, but that's another video. Um, so a narrative-based society is governed by guilt, and a and a humanist society, I think, is is governed by might makes right. And, and I think it's, it's, it's might makes right on multiple different levels. It's might makes right in terms of competence. The most competent people or the most dominant people are the people who can 
convince the most people, they, they, they end up leading those societies. Um, and you can kind of see this in, you can see this in Rome. You can see this in, in the fact that basically, I think all of these societies practiced slavery in one form or another. And it was a, it was a guilt-based society that abolished slavery. Um, that's just one example. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot of different things that, that you can extrapolate from it, but I think the, those are, those are some of the core kind of elements of that. Humanist societies value aesthetics as their highest, highest prob priority. They operate under the principle of might makes right. And I think they all have a view that consciousness more or less ends after death. And you could say, well, what about Hades? Hades is basically you're just, you know, you're in a sad place forever and ever and ever. And you have no will and no kind of autonomy. Like you're, you're just, you're just sitting in a dark place forever. It's that's, that's. That is effectively an end of consciousness. You know, you could say that consciousness continues, but really it doesn't. Um, consciousness only matters when you have an, an ability to af affect things uh, and you have will. And in, in Hades, you don't have that. Not really. So you know, I, that's, that's another video too. But, and the thing is, the thing is, I think for both both of these worldviews. For both of these worldviews, there are good arguments. And you can't really prove or disprove either of them. You know, reality could be one where there is no God, there is no narrative, and it is really just chaotic and random, and we kind of hold on to our consciousness with a white knuckles through aesthetics. And then we scream into the void, our art, as we slowly fade away. Or the meaning of your life, even if it's a small life, even if it's, if it's something where you don't really do much, the meaning comes from something much, much deeper. It comes from the fact that everything matters and it matters on an infinite time horizon because you or your consciousness has the potential to infinitely exist. And there is a greater consciousness that observes you and is kind of taking your life and letting it literally echo through an eternity or for eternity. Now, each, each of these options, I think, are, are terrifying. But I think, ultimately, what humanity has, has discovered through the thousands of years of our thought on this and the way that we've organized ourselves is that reality fundamentally is either of these options. And... and I think these are the only societies that have that that we have seen come into existence that are stable. And what that suggests to me is that these are the only things that can you can really probably consider to be true because if you are designing something to exist long term it needs to be more or less true. And well, ultimately, ultimately, I think it is up to us as human beings to choose which set of beliefs that we want to abide by or assume are true. And in the end, maybe we'll figure out which one is true. But for now... 
it's a guess that we have to make. 